Welcome everyone to Calculus BC. In today's episode, we're going to be continuing our adventure through uh, chapter 9.5, which is alternating series, and we're going to be ending off this adventure with the alternating series error bound. And the basic premise behind alternating series error bound is we're going to be using a partial sum to estimate the infinite series, uh, and we're going to be estimating what that infinite series actually converges to. So unlike all of the other convergence tests we've been doing. We haven't really been able to find the sum, but in this case, we're going to try and find out what the sum is going to be heading towards. And, and obviously, with us using uh, a partial sum to estimate an infinite sum, there's going to be a little bit of wrongness that happens, and that's why we call this alternating series error bound. We're going to be finding out just how wrong we are whenever we do these summations. So. In order to illustrate how the error bound actually works, I'm going to start off with an example of something that we can find the infinite sum of. I'm going to start off with, an, with, a, uh, with a geometric series. And so I'm going to start off with k equals 1 to infinity of negative 1 third to the k minus 1 power. So if I was to expand out the first few terms, I would get 1 minus 1 third plus 1 ninth minus 1 over 27 plus 1 over 81 minus 1 over 243 plus 1 over 729 minus dot, dot, dot. And I could just keep on going. Now, of course, this being a geometric series, I could find out what the sum actually is. But again, I want to I illustrate what the alternating series error bound does. That way we can see uh, how it will behave for a non-alternating, uh, for a non-geometric but yet alternating series. So from here, I'm going to use the sum of the first four terms. So I'm going to use the sum of the first four terms, so s sub 4, to approximate, to approximate s. So this will be the sum of the first four terms right here. It'll be from term 1, from 1 all the way through 1 over 27. So this is the first four terms right here, so s sub 4 right here. So from here, what is s sub 4? <clears throat> Well, s sub 4 is going to be 1 minus 1 third plus 1 ninth minus 1 over 27. And that's going to get me, after doing all the common denominator work, that's going to be 20 over 27, which is approximately equal to 0 0.7407. So again, this is my four term, my four term estimation. Now, what I want to focus on right now is this term right here. This term right here. Because everything from here on out would actually be considered my remainder, right? Remainder. Now from here, this term right here is what I'm going to call the error bound. And the reason why it's called the error bound is because it's the first term of the remainder. Now, the error bound term has a pretty special quality. If I was to look at, so if I was to look at my remainder, if I was to say, let's say 1 over 81 minus 1 over 243 uh, plus 1 over 729 minus 1 over, I'm going to keep on going with this for a little bit, 1 over 2187 and then looks like plus 1 over 6561. If I was to actually kind of rework this a little bit, what I could do is I could actually subtract entire quantities. I could say 1 over 81 minus the entire quantity of 1 over 243 minus 1 over 729. And then I could do minus the entire quantity of 1 over 2187 minus 1 over 6561. Now, when we first rolled out the alternating series, we determined that because in this case, the left number is bigger than the right number, that means I'm going to be subtracting a very small positive value. And then I'm going to be, again, subtracting a very, very small positive value here, right? So it looks like 1 over 81 is consistently subtracting. And actually, whatever this next term is, it's probably going to be very, very, very small positive, right? And then from here, very v to the fourth power, small positive values here. So. Consistently, what's happening with my remainder is I'm taking my 1 over 81, and I'm subtracting very, very small values from it. And so hopefully it makes sense 
that this term here, what I call the error bound, right? So my, I know that my error bound term is going to be always greater than or equal to all of the remaining terms being added or subtracted together. And so this is why it's called the error bound. What, what we can decipher from this is that the error bound could be considered, this is the most wrong the estimation will be. Right, so in other words, in the context of this particular series, the most wrong I'm going to be with this decimal here, when I use the first four terms to estimate the sum of the infinite series, the most wrong I will be will be 1 over 81. So let's see how that works. So a few minutes ago, a few seconds ago, we found out that, uh, that the summation of the first four terms was this 0 0.70, uh, 0.7407. So I'm going to go and write that down right here. So it's 0 0.7407. And I talked about how my 1 over 81 is my error bound term. That's the most wrong that I'm going to be. Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use my error bound term to create what I call a window of wrongness. And so I'm going to go ahead and take this uh, decimal number here, and I'm going to add 1 over 81 to it, and I'm also going to subtract 1 over 81 from it. So if I add 1 over 81 to it, and I convert it to a decimal, I've already done this in the calculator, I get 0 0.75304. My lower bound of wrongness is going to be 0 0.72835. So again, this is my window right here, right? This is my window of answers. The most wrong I'm going to be is going to be here. The least wrong I'm going to be is going to be, is going to be there. And so, and I know that my, my, my actual sum is going my actual sum is going to be within this window of wrongness right here because i know that my answer is going to be uh, with this <clears throat> so now from here what is the sum actually going to be well if i was to do the sum that would be it looks like 1 which is my first term right remember a sub 1 over 1 minus r in this case the r if you look back at this the r is uh, negative one third, so that'll be negative one third right here and I'm going to get 1 over 1 plus 1 third, which is going to be 1 over, looks like that's going to be 3 thirds right there. So 4 thirds, which is really 3 fourths, or 0 0.75. So is my answer within this window of wrongness? It totally is. It's on the upper bound of it, kind of. My 0 0.75 exists within this window of wrongness right here. And so within my window of wrongness is my right answer. So that is how error works when we do an alternating series error bound. We take the sum of the first n amount of terms. The term after the last term is always considered our error bound. And we use that as our error bound because that is the most wrong that we are going to be. And then from there, we can go ahead and know that within a, win within a particular window, if we do plus error bound, minus error bound from our estimation, we will end up having uh, the, our answer somewhere within that window. Hopefully that makes sense. I'll be back in a flash with error bound defined, and I'll relate all the terms back into uh, what we've just done. Give me a second. And here we go. We are about to define alternating series error bound. Now, there's a lot of symbology on the board right now, but don't worry. I will, I will break down each piece and explain uh, what each piece means. Basically, this if statement, all it's saying is that if you have a convergent, if you have a, uh, convergent, a convergent alternating series. So again, what are the qualifications of this? Well, we know that b sub n has to decrease, right? Has to decrease. And that the limit as n goes to infinity of b sub n has to go to zero. In other words, your series does need to fulfill the qualifications of the alternating series test. And so if we know that, th that, our, that our series is going to converge, right, based on the alternating series test, then we can apply alternating series error bound to it to use a partial sum to estimate what the sum is actually going to converge towards. So hopefully that makes a little bit of sense right there. So let's talk about this symbology here. What does all this stuff mean? Well, the absolute value of r to the n is what we call the remainder, right? So the remainder. 
Now, how do we get the remainder? Another, another word for remainder is our actual error. All right, that's our actual error. So if I, so if I was to approximate 20 people on the ship, and there was 22 people on the ship, my error would be two, because I have two people remaining who I didn't count. Now notice how it's an absolute value. There's, you know, that's just to make sure that your remainder is always positive. Now from here, these S's, what this means is that your, what, what this uh, capital S stands for is this is the actual sum right here. And then this S sub N is your estimated sum. So what this is basically saying up to this point is your remainder is equal to the actual sum minus the minus the estimated sum. That should make sense, right? Whatever the whatever's remaining is the difference between what was really there versus what you thought was going to be there. Now this piece right here that talks about the b sub n plus one, this guy has got to be less than b sub n plus one. This b sub n plus one is your error bound term. This is the term after right after the summation. So what are all the players of this in the last scenario? Well, we didn't actually find out what our actual error was, but we will in just a second. But our error bound term was the one over 81 in all of this. All right, so in this case, this, I'll go and draw the analogy here, this is the one over 81. And that's going to be greater than or equal to our actual error, right? So what was our actual error? Well, from here, I'm going to take the actual sum, which is going to be 0 0.75, and I'm going to subtract our sum, which is going to be 0 0.7407, and put that in absolute value. And if I was to actually subtract those in a calculator, I would end up with 0 0.0093, and is that actually less than or equal to 1 over 81? Well, if I divide that in a calculator, I get 0 0.01234. So yes, my definition of error actually does match. And so again, the notion of uh, the remainder being the difference between the sum, uh, the actual sum, and the estimated sum, and that has to be less than the error bound term. Again, remember, the error bound term is the most wrong that we are going to be, right? We define that up here. The error bound term is the most wrong that the estimation is going to be. And again, that's because from the error bound term, you're subtracting very, very small positives all the way through, and, uh, and that is why the error bound term is always larger than, uh, than all the terms being combined after it. So it's kind of an interesting idea. So that is error bound defined. I'll be right back with some more examples on how this can get a little more complicated. Be right back. All right, so in our first example here, we're gonna be finding the bound of this alternating series right here. And so within this alternating series, we have three prompts here. We have to show that the series converges. So in other words, we have to use the alternating series test on this thing. And then we have to find the sum of the first six terms. So what I'm going to have to find here is to find s sub 6. I'll probably use a calculator for that. And then I'm going to show that s sub 6 differs from s by less than 3 over 1,000. In other words, my error is going to be less than that. So how do I get this started? So in A, let's just go ahead and show that the series converges. So how do I do that? Well, I'm going to show that a sub n is decreasing, right? So I'm going to go ahead and use the ratio test on this one here. So I'm going to say 3 over 2 to the n plus 1 times n plus 1 plus 1, which is n plus 2, times 2 to the n times n plus 1 over 3. So the 3 is going to cancel each other out. And what I end up with here is 2 to the n times 2 the two to the n's cancel each other out. So what I end up with is I end up with n plus one over two parentheses n plus two. And in the ratio test, when it comes to uh, sequence, uh, sequence decreasing, I'm gonna compare that to one, and I know that that is true for all n greater than or equal to one. So I know that my terms are decreasing, right? So I know that a sub n is decreasing. Well, what else do I know? I know that if I take the limit, if I take the limit as n goes to infinity of 3 over, that's a 3, sorry, 3 over 2 to the n times n plus 1, well, there's no way this thing isn't going to 0, right? That's a pretty fast convergent series right there. So because I've got the decreasing and the limit portion taken care of, I can then say, therefore, 
by the alternating series test, the sum from n equals 1 to infinity of negative 1 to the n plus 1 times 3 over 2 to the n times n plus 1 converges. So I can go ahead and do that. So I've already shown that the series converges. I'm good. That's part A. Part B says to now find the sum of the first six terms. So I'll go ahead and do that. That's going to be pretty fast. Uh, so that's going to be s sub 6 is equal to 3 fourths minus 1 fourth plus 3 over 32 minus 3 over 80 plus 1 over 64 minus 3 over 448. Again, this is just in a calculator here. After I calculate all of the stuff, common denominators, decimals, all that stuff, I get 0 0.565. And this right here, this is my estimated sum. OK, so that's, that's the sum of the first six terms there. Now, part C is saying, show that my sixth term addition is going to differ from the actual from the actual sum by less than uh, 3 over 1,000. So remember, I know that based on my definition of error bound that we saw a few minutes ago, that the actual sum minus my sum of the first six terms is going to be less than or equal to, remember, my error bound is my seventh term, right? So my seventh term, this is going to be b sub 7 right here, whatever that, no whatever that number is. Remember, this is my error bound. Remember, this is the most wrong that I'm ever going to be when using my finite series to estimate the infinite series value. So I know that my b sub 7, right? Well, that's what happens when I plug 7 into the sequence generator. Well, what is that going to be? Well, that's going to be 3 over 2 to the 7th times 8. All right? So again, I just kind of plug that all into here, right? I'll plug that all into here. And again, I'm taking the magnitude of it, so it doesn't need to be negative or positive. It, it doesn't need to be negative. So if I was to actually uh, multiply this thing out here, um, let's see, 2 to the 7th is, looks like times 2 to the, times 2 to the 3rd. That's 2 to the 10th. And I know that this is going to be 1, 0, 2, 4. And that right there is going to be less than 3 over 1,000. So I know that my, my actual sum, whoops, my actual sum minus the sum of the first six terms will be less than or equal to this value, which is going to be less than the 3 over 1,000. So my, my difference between my actual sum versus my estimated sum is, in fact, less than 3 over 1,000. Because my error bound term, again, what is this? This is the most wrong that I can be, that I can be with this estimation right here. That's the most wrong I'm going to be. So hopefully that makes sense. I'll be back with another example. Give me a second. In this next example, I'm going to uh, be asked how many terms are necessary for the appropriate amount of error. So what they do is they give me this series here of negative 1 to the k plus 1 over k factorial. And they want me to have an error, an error of less than 0 0.00001. So what they're asking me is, how many terms will I need to sum up of this particular series so that my error is less than this? So if I was to just expand this thing out, what would happen is I would end up with 1 minus 1 over 2 factorial plus 1 over 3 factorial uh, minus 1 over 4 factorial plus dot, dot, dot. And then eventually, I would end up in my nth term, whatever that number would be, right? So it was like the seventh term, the eighth term, the twelfth term. I would end up with somehow, uh, somehow negative 1 to the n plus 1 over n factorial. Again, this is my nth term. And this is going to be the final term that allows me to have a sum with presumably an error of less than this value. So the way I'm going to figure out how many terms I'm going to need is I actually need to bound this sum, right? So uh, we've talked about this a little bit earlier. If I bound this sum with the error bound, right, my error bound term would be negative 1 to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 factorial, right? Like this would be the next term. 
in my in my sequence that would be my error bound right this is the this is the most wrong that my summation approximation is actually going to be so the way I'm going to go ahead and do this is I'm going to take the absolute value of this right we always look at the magnitude of that term not just the positivity or the negativity so I'm going to say I want my error right my I want my maximum wrongness my maximum wrongness to be less than 0 0.00001 so how do I deal with this? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and say 1 over n plus 1 factorial has got to be less than. I'm going to convert him out into a fraction. So he's going to be 1 over, looks like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 0. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 zeros. And I'm going to go and solve for n like this. But before I do that, I'm going to go ahead and flip both, inequal, uh, both fractions here, making me reverse my inequality. So it uh, looks like 100,000 like that. And so now from here, I'm going to look, what I'm going to look for is, remember, I'm going to, I'm looking for the smallest value of n that's going to make this true. Just because I have flipped my values doesn't change that. I'm looking for the smallest value of n to satisfy the inequality. I'm going to write that down, actually, that way we don't forget. Look for the smallest value of n to satisfy the inequality. Right, because I want the I want the smallest amount of terms that's going to get me this type of error. Now, at this point, factorials are often hard to solve for. We're going to have to revert back to an old tool that we learned in Integrated One, which is the looking inside method for for solving. So at this point, it's a little bit trial and error. If you let n equals six, and I kind of already did this in the calculator, so I did cheat a little bit. So I apologize. If I let n equals six, that means that the entire summation here with the factorial would be. 5040, zero, zero, right? That would be, that would actually, let me go and uh, slow that down a little bit. If I let n equal 6, that means I end up with 7 factorial, which is 5040. If I let n equal 7, that would be, it looks like 8 factorial, which is going to be 43200, zero, zero, still too low. If I let n equal 8, that ends up being 9 factorial, which actually is. 362880, which is actually the first number that we have, which is larger than 100,000. So in other words, when n equals 8, we have enough terms. So we will need, we will need 8 terms for this accuracy. We would need 8 terms for an accuracy of, so this accuracy, in other words, the accuracy of less than 0 0.00001. So hopefully that example made sense. Uh, again, it's always about the error bound, right? We wanted an error of less than this much. In other words, my maximum wrongness, I would set less than this amount. And that is how we were able to find the n, uh, the, the number of terms. So hopefully that makes sense. I'm going to take it one step further in the final example here, and uh, I'll be back with that in just a second. So in the last example here, we're going to find the approximation to the sum of the series correct to three decimal places. So what this problem does is it takes the last problem and takes it one step further. Not only are we going to be required to find the number of terms necessary to approximate a sum to three decimal places, but we're actually going to have to find out what that sum is. So we're going to go ahead and initiate that. So hopefully you guys just see this as the same problem as before, just with an extra layer. Now we actually have to find the sum based on the number of terms that we are able to, to find. And so uh, from here, there is one thing about this that is actually a little bit tricky here, and that is this whole three decimal places here. The interpretation of this is going to be a little bit odd, so hopefully just put a star next to that. Uh, that, might, uh, that might confuse a little, uh, some people here, uh, but we'll go and explain it the best we can. So from here, again, if I was to just expand this thing out, I would know that somehow we're going to end up with like an a sub 1, right? And we're going to end up with, uh, you know, some type of plus a sub 2. And I know they're going to alternate, but ultimately, I'm just going to go and look at the magnitudes of each term. a sub 3, a sub 4. And we want to know how many terms we're going to get, right? So I know that down the chain, I'm going to end up with plus dot, dot, dot. And I'm going to end up with a finite series, right? It's going to end up at a sub n, right? And that's going to be the final term. This is the final term in the summation in the summation. But remember, this is all the stuff that I'm adding up. What I want is I want my term afterwards, right? I want my a sub n plus 1 term. Again, why? The a sub n plus 1 term, 
that is my error bound term, right? This is my max wrongness, my max wrongness here. And I want my max wrongness to be accurate to three decimal places. So I want my maximum wrongness, right? My, I want my maximum wrongness to be less than the three decimals. So hopefully that interpretation makes enough sense here. So the way I interpret my error bound term is going to be one, right? Again, I just look at the magnitude of it. And in this case, instead of k to the fourth, it'll be, or rather n to the fourth, right? My last term of the sequence, it'll be n plus one to the fourth power. And now I want that to be less than the three decimal places. Here's where things are gonna get a little bit tricky. I'm actually, you would think it's gonna be 0, 0.000, right? And you would think it's gonna be one based on the last example, but here's the thing, is that it's actually 0 0.0005. The reason why that five is there is because that five is the threshold for whether or not we round upwards. So this is the threshold for rounding upwards. And if I want myself to be less than that threshold, then I don't want to round up because rounding up from five would turn this guy into a one, making him no longer accurate to three decimal places, right? And so I want my value to be less than that threshold. I hope that makes sense. It's a little bit odd. Um, and actually, I'll even go into why, even if you set it equal to, it wouldn't matter. Um, and hopefully I can show that to be true as well. So it's the, it's the same, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm going to, uh, I'm gonna make him one over n plus one to the fourth, uh, less than, in this case, it'll be five over one, two, three, four, one with one, two, three, four zeros. If I flip this guy, I'm gonna get n plus one to the fourth. That's gotta be greater than 10,000 over five, which is really n plus one to the fourth greater than 2000. And again, this is just that whole looking inside method. We learned this in integrated one. It's just kind of a pain again. So again, just kind of let things happen here. Uh, I'm going to kind of guess high at this point just to save a little bit of time. If I let n equal six, then what I have is I have seven to the fourth power and seven to the fourth power is 2401, which actually is greater than 2000. So that means that we need, we will, or rather we will be adding six terms. So what this ultimately becomes is it ultimately becomes one over one to the fourth minus one over two to the fourth plus one over three to the fourth. Uh, let's see, minus one over four to the fourth plus one over five to the fourth, minus one over six to the fourth. Okay, I'll be right back. I'm gonna put that into a calculator. Give me one second. So here I am at my trusty TI Inspire. Have I kind of punched it in here, just making sure that I'm alternating one minus plus minus plus minus. So I'm gonna go and just hit control enter here, grab my decimal, and I get this number here, 0 0.9467678, blah, blah, blah. And that is going to be my sum accurate to three decimal places, 0 0.967, right? So that's my three decimal places right there. And so, uh, yeah, so I needed to add six terms together to get that actual sum. Hopefully this idea of alternating series error bound makes sense. Uh, as always, uh, please leave comments or questions in the comments area. I will see you all in the next episode.